right, everybody, we're uh, going to get started with our flood awareness talk. Um, well, first of all, I want to make sure everybody can can hear. We have a, uh, a chat room. Just uh, go ahead and someone someone say hello or tell us where you're from or something. There we go. All right, Eric. Good, good, good. All right. Well, uh, ignore the uh, commotion behind me. I'm working from home, and uh, my daughter and my wife are about to head out to an appointment. So, uh, try to, they'll be out here in a second, but uh, we'll get started. So, uh, welcome. We're very excited to have everybody here today for our flood awareness talk. Uh, we have four speakers from our office. Um, I'll start uh, myself. Hold on, I lost my camera. There we go. Okay, so uh, so for today, um, I'm Charles Ross. I'm the service hydrologist at the National Weather Service Office in State College. I've uh, been here for over 10 years now. Love it here. Uh, have uh, I think uh, a great job. Uh, we get to, to deal with flooding and run the flood program at the office. We have a really talented office, and you'll get to meet a, a few of them here today. And uh, uh, should be a really good talk. You'll see there's the questions. And there's a chat bar. If you have anything that you're uncertain of or any questions, just go ahead and type the message in and uh, we'll answer them for sure at the end of the talk. And uh, we'll, uh, anything that uh, you need clarification on, don't hesitate to ask. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speakers today and we'll get going. So uh, first we have our one of our student volunteers here, Miranda Bidding. She's uh, a senior meteorology student at the University of Delaware. Um, and so she's over... Uh, just outside of Pennsylvania right now, close to the ocean, and uh, finishing up her studies. She's been a volunteer here all winter long. We've really enjoyed having her. Um, the good news for Miranda is she was admitted to grad school here at Penn State, so she'll be at the University Park campus next fall uh, pursuing her master's degree. And uh, congratulations on that. That's uh, really exciting. Um, um, next, our second speaker will be Rachel Gutierrez. She uh, is at the office today and having camera issues, so we aren't going to get to see Rachel, but we're going to certainly get to hear her. She's uh, one of our newer meteorologists. She joined here a little over a year ago at our office, and she is a uh, uh, Penn State graduate in meteorology and um, uh, just, you know, does a lot of outreach for our office, so as you see more things from us, you'll certainly get to see uh, more of Rachel's presentations and, uh, and get to know her. Um, she's a Chicagoland native and uh, certainly uh, enjoy getting to talk Chicago pizza with her. That's uh, I have a lot of family from the Chicago area, and uh, anytime I go over there, uh, I always bring Rachel back a pizza. So uh, uh, next we have uh, Jonathan Guzman. Uh, Jonathan's been here for a little over six months. He replaced the uh, great Pete Young as our warning and coordination meteorologist, and Jonathan is uh, taking over and, and uh, certainly running. Uh, with the program is uh, we're making a lot of uh, great uh, strides forward after Pete is uh, re uh, in retirement now. We miss Pete, but really happy we have Jonathan here. And uh, he's uh, uh, pretty much, uh, if there's a, a liaison between our office and the outside world, you're going to work with Jonathan on that. And uh, um, he moved here from a weather service office in Kentucky, and uh, we're really happy to have him on board. And uh, our fourth speaker is uh, Connor Chapman. Now, Connor is a PhD student right now. He's another one of our volunteers. So uh, we've had him again this winter and really enjoyed having him uh, begin to show him the ropes of what we do at our office. He's a PhD student in geography and climate science at Penn State. Um, he's like all of us. He's uh, been passionate about the weather since he was a young kid. Um, never cared for cartoons. He cared for the Weather Channel. And, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, I, the Weather Channel was just starting out, but I probably would have liked that over cartoons as well. Um, he uh, has a uh, BS degree in uh, meteorology from SUNY uh, Oneana in upstate New York. And uh, right now he's uh, working on his PhD here at Penn State. And uh, after grad school, he wants to uh, work on his education uh, you know, experiences to engage with the public on weather and climate. So, uh, Really happy to have Connor here as well today. So um, with that said, we're going to lead it off with uh, um, uh, Miranda speaking on some flood safety topics, and uh, we'll get it going. So thanks again for joining. 
All right, thanks for the introductions. There's a bit of a lag here, sorry. Okay, thought I'd start off with a brief introduction of who the NWS State College Central PA Forecast Office is. So the staff consists of 14 forecasters, six electronic technicians or IT support, one hydrologist, that would be Charles, you just met him, one science and operations officer, or Sue as we call them, who are in charge of research and development for the office, one observations program leader, or OPAL, we have nicknames for all of them pretty much, but OPALs deal with observational data from partners and the public, one warning coordination meteorologist, or WCM, that's Jonathan, you'll hear from him later, one administrative assistant, and of course our meteorologist in charge, who is like the boss. We're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to provide important forecasts and warning information to the public, as well as maintain the radar and other observation systems. So before we get too deep into this presentation, I wanted to take a minute to just explain how important flood safety really is. So floods have become the most frequent type of natural disaster. This wasn't always the case, but in recent years, they have become the most frequent type for a couple of different reasons, including climate change and development. For instance, between 1998 and 2017, flooding impacted more than 2 billion people around the world. So this is, it does have very far reaching impacts. And it may surprise some of you to know that in the US, more people are killed by floods every year than tornadoes or lightning. So floods actually are the most deadly impact of severe weather. Although they don't get quite the same media attention that things like tornadoes get. So that's one of the reasons we're doing this. Flood safety is very important and it's important that people are prepared and have a plan in case floods break out in their area. So just to explain um, some of the basics of NWS hazard messaging in regard to flooding. For example, if the Weather Service issues a flooding advisory for your area, that means flooding is not expected to be bad enough to need a warning, but it still could be very inconvenient and it could lead to more dangerous situations down the line. So at this stage, this just means that the Weather Service wants you to be aware there could be flood conditions, maybe stay at home, don't get on the roads if you don't need to, for example. One step up is a watch. This is a little bit different. This means that conditions are favorable for flooding doesn't necessarily guarantee that a flood will happen in your area, but it means all the ingredients are there and this could develop into a more dangerous situation. So at this point, uh, we want you to be prepared to have a plan in, in case the situation does worsen, make sure you know what you're going to do. And then lastly, a warning. This means that a flood is either currently happening or is about to happen, guaranteed. So this is the action phase. If you're in a low-lying area, or a flood prone area, maybe you wanna to move to higher ground, or in case it's a more serious situation, you may even need to evacuate. So flood warnings need to be taken seriously. This means that you may need to take action to protect yourself. So now I'm going to touch on the different types of floods briefly, and then go more in detail in the coming slides. First one I'm sure you've all heard of is a flash flood. As the name suggests, these happen very quickly and they can be life-threatening. So most of the time, these are caused by very heavy rainfall over a short amount of time, but occasionally they can be caused by things like dam breaks. Next is aerial flooding. Unlike flash flooding, these tend to be a result of more gradual, prolonged rainfall. And these are usually not as intense as flash floods, although they still can be dangerous. But since they develop more slowly, there usually is more lead time and more time for people to prepare and you know, take cover. So lastly is river flooding. Um, in central PA, at least, these are usually the slowest to develop, although that does depend on the local climatology. So in central PA, at least, these typically have the most warning lead time. And this is just when the river rises above a certain threshold and floods the nearby areas around the river. So starting off with flash flooding, these are defined as life-threatening floods that begin within six hours or often within three hours of some causative event. 
Now, 99% of the time, this causative event is going to be intense rainfall. And what I mean by that is very heavy rainfall that falls in a short amount of time, for example, from a severe thunderstorm. Although occasionally, on more rare occasions, flash floods can be caused by river ice jams or the failure of a dam or a levee. Uh, that picture on the right is an example of an ice jam. Now, one historical example of a flash flood that you may have heard of is the 1977 Johnstown flood. Uh, this event was caused by a line of thunderstorms, one after the other, moving through the Johnstown area. We like to call this training because the storms moved in one after another like a train. And together, they produced very large amounts of rainfall in a relatively short amount of time, which created very dangerous flash flood conditions in and around Johnstown. And then aerial flooding, like I mentioned, this develops more gradually, usually from prolonged moderate to heavy rainfall. And what this does is it creates a buildup of water in low-lying flood-prone areas, as well as like small creeks and streams. And unlike flash flooding, this usually occurs more than six hours after it starts raining. So again, it's usually warned with more lead time. And as the name suggests, it may cover a very large area. I, for example, live in Newark, Delaware, and if you're not familiar, it's very low-lying, as most of Delaware is, and I also live near downtown, so there are a lot of impervious surfaces like roads, and what that means is that the rainfall can't seep into the soil and it just runs off. So in our area, at least, it seems like any time we get any amount of significant rainfall, we're under some kind of aerial flooding, and that just means that water builds up on the roads and the creeks and streams kind of rise above their normal level. Uh, it's raining right now. I wonder if it will get to that point today. And lastly, river flooding occurs when the river levels rise and overflow their banks and run into areas that are normally dry, normally not part of the river. So again, these are usually caused by heavy rainfall, but they can also be caused by things like dam failures, rapidly melting snow and ice jams. And these actually are classified as either minor, moderate, or major, based both on the height that the water reaches, as well as the impacts downstream along the river. Um, a historical example of this is the 1889 Johnstown flood. Not to be confused with the 1977 one I was just talking about, but in the 1889 event, there, was, there were several days of very intense rainfall over the Johnstown area, and that actually accumulated so much water that the South Fork Dam actually broke and released 14 and a half million cubic meters of water. And if you can't imagine how much that is, it's actually comparable to the flow rate of the Mississippi River. So during that event, unfortunately, over 2,200 people did end up dying. But today we have better infrastructure, better technology. So these catastrophic dam failures they still can happen, of course, but they're happening less and less frequently. So usually our flooding events today are more often than not caused by very heavy rainfall. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to talk about what you should do during a flood. All right, hello everyone. Apologies that my webcam is not working today, um, but hopefully everyone can hear me just fine. Um, I saw that a few more people uh, popped in as we were speaking, as Miranda was speaking. So just a few notes here. So if you can ask us any questions you want in the chat box. And then also um, there's some handouts on the right panel for the GoToWebinar. Um, one of those is Flood Awareness uh, Week. And that's the PDF for this actual presentation here with all the hyperlinks. In it. And then the other one is Weather Awareness Links, which are just some helpful links for um, looking at different weather information resources that you might want to bookmark. So take a look at those handouts. We'll of course send those out after the talk today, but we'll get moving on here to what to do during a flood. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is obviously stay informed. So listen to the radio or your television. Um, and this includes no weather radio. I know that's a little bit old, old school. Maybe you don't have a weather radio or maybe you have a really old one that batteries aren't working anymore, but uh, having a weather radio is really, really helpful because it'll turn on anytime there's an alert where you are within the uh, polygon or the zone 
of interest there. So if you are within a flood warning or a severe thunderstorm warning, for example, your weather radio will turn on and alert you to what's happening. So this is really good to have for severe weather events, but it's also just good to have because you can listen to the weather forecast pretty much anytime you want if you tune into the radio. So it's a good thing to have in your house if you don't have one, especially if the power goes out, you can't watch the TV or your phone isn't charged, et cetera, et cetera. So highly recommend that you invest in one, even though it is a little old school, it's good to have. Um, and of course, check the internet for and social media for updates. We're posting on social media at least three times a day, if not more. Um, so be sure to check that out. And we have all the social media listed here at the bottom, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and even YouTube now. So uh, just be sure to be checking that and then uh, use whatever information resources that you normally use because um, staying informed is what's gonna keep you safe. And then when there is a flood, make sure that you're getting to higher ground. So if you know that you're living in a flood prone area, it's low lying, it's near a river, uh, maybe you live on the first floor of a building and, or if you're camping, then you know you're gonna need to get to higher ground if there is a flood happening near you or around you. Um, if you don't know if you're living in a flood prone area, we're actually gonna talk about resources available to you to figure that out. Um, there are flood inundation maps where you can go figure out if you're in a flood prone area but definitely want to be getting to higher ground if you are in a flood area or there's a flood threat. So if there is a flood, you wanna definitely obey the evacuation orders. Um, if, if the police or FEMA is telling you to evacuate, you wanna to listen to them. They're not trying to you know, make you uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable to leave your house. Um, looting is definitely something that people are afraid of if they have to evacuate and leave their house, but Make sure you do so because this is just to protect you, to protect your life. So lock your home when you leave. If you can, disconnect all your utilities and appliances um, because as you can see here, appliances and utilities and water is not a good combination. You don't wanna suffer from electrocution or have anybody else suffer from that. So um, evacuate if you're told to do so. This is just to save your life. Um, we may wanna make sure that everyone's out of harm's way. And then make sure you're practicing electrical safety. So don't go into a basement or any room if the water is covering your electrical outlets or your cords are submerged. Um, this means that you can be in danger of getting electrocuted. If you see some sparks or hear buzzing, crackling or snapping, popping noises, like if anybody's made the jiffy pop over the campfire and hear that like crackling popping, definitely do not wanna enter the water at that point. Um, stay out of the water, just leave. Don't worry about unplugging things at that point because you could be electrocuted. So um, leave your house, leave that area, don't touch the water. You don't wanna get electrocuted. And then when there's a flood, you want to make sure you're avoiding floodwaters. Um, do not walk through the flooded waters. They are quite disgusting. <laughs> they carry lots of diseases and trash. You can imagine all the gross stuff that's on the sidewalks and on the streets are getting washed away and they're coming towards you. So you don't wanna be uh, going into these floodwaters and getting dirty or catching a disease. Um, you, don't also, you also don't wanna be trapped by moving water. So if you have, happen to be trapped, go to the highest point possible, call 911, and then absolutely do not drive into flooded roadways or around a barricade that says, don't drive around the barricade because the road is flooded. So we have a little saying in the National Weather Service, turn around, don't drown definitely want to follow this when uh, there's road, excuse me, when there's water on the roadway, because you don't necessarily know how deep it is or how fast it's flowing. Sometimes the surface of water doesn't look like it's flowing at all, but it could be raging underneath and it could sweep you away. It doesn't take much water for uh, cars to be swept away. Only six inches of moving water can knock you off your feet and sweep you away. 12 inches of water can float away a small car or SUV and then 18 inches of white can pretty much carry away any large vehicle. So you don't wanna be driving into this, your car will stall, you won't be able to get out, and then you'll be floating downstream. Most deaths in floods uh, occur when, when someone drives through flooded waters. Miranda said that flood, flooding is the number one cause of severe weather death, and that's because people don't follow the turnaround, don't drown rule. So if there's one thing you take away from this lecture today, it would be don't, Turn around, don't drown. You don't wanna drive through flooded waters when there is water on the roadway. All right, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to our warning coordination meteorologist.
All right, thanks, Rachel. So uh, we're going to go through now a few slides on some uh, products and that where you can look to for flash flood guidance and then more so for river flooding. Um, so kind of give you an idea of where you can go on the web and uh, pick out that information. So the first one here. There we go. Sorry. There's the lag. OK. The, uh, the River Forecast Center, the homepage, you can also get to this uh, from a, uh, where we are in, in State College, the Weather Forecast Office side. You can get to these graphs that we're going to show you here in a minute from here. But we're co-located um, in State College with the uh, Mid-Atlantic River Forecast Center. So take a look at their page here. Uh, you see the River Observations and Forecast drop-down menu. And then you come to their service area there on the left. You see all these green points uh, from lower New York along the Susquehanna River and then going down uh, into Maryland um, and well south of State College but this is their uh, what's called hydrologic service area so each of these uh, green dots denote a specific uh, river gauge and uh, what the stage is currently at that's what the color is showing you here so green is depicting no flooding at the current time and you see the ledge on the right there um, advisory uh, level or near flood stage, if you will, it would be yellow, minor flooding, orange, moderate red, and, and purple would be major flooding. So you can uh, hover over these and get what's called a hydrograph, which will actually go through uh, a forecast and then uh, the latest observations on what that uh, particular gauge point's done. And then you can also click on it and um, get a little better depiction. So like right here, so again, it's called a hydrograph. So you can get this for any of these, uh, or most of the river, uh, the, the points there we just saw on that last page, all the river forecast points. You see here this blue trace. This is actually showing you the past uh, few days of the observations of that gauge of what it's actually done in time. So one of the things us, uh, one of the duties we do is go through and actually quality control these. Uh, most of them are automated to so make sure that the, the Point data is correct and then you see the uh, the current time that the forecast is put out by the river forecast center here in this dash line dash vertical line and then everything and point to the right of that is a forecast so again for us it's the mid-atlantic river forecast center for most of our uh, area and state college that we wanted forecast for and they put this out for so uh, it just depends on exactly where you're at on uh, what point what gauge you're looking at as to how uh, quickly these rises and falls occur. So say in a larger um, branch or stem of a main river such as the Susquehanna, uh, it may take you know a day or two uh, to crest and then the same thing on the way down, it may take several days for it to fall back down to its normal flow stage uh, as opposed to if you're at a more of a headwater point of a smaller uh, river or creek or stream, you would see these probably spike a lot quicker and then drop down a lot faster. So um, we talked about uh, Miranda and uh, Rachel have already kind of alluded to a little bit on the safety and aspects, the flash flooding. So uh, the quicker responses are going to be, if you will, the flashier type points like that, as opposed to if you're further downstream on a, on a larger river, it's going to be a little slower to go up and down. So the more, uh, the more urbanized, uh, you see the bullet there kind of getting at that, the flashier, uh, faster response rates. And then just depending on exactly uh, where the precipitation falls, how fast or slow it falls, it's going to determine a lot there. So, uh, again, if you go to weather.gov uh, and then slash MARFC for the Mid-Atlantic River Forecast Center, or you can do slash CTP and then link, it's linked off our page too on uh, river observations. And you can click on the green dots on that map and come to the gauges just like this. Then one of the tools that uh, we use and is available also on the uh, web here, uh, flash flood guidance. So you see the, the definition there. Uh, so it's uh, basically a number value or range of uh, average rainfall over um, a given area in time to initiate the, the flash flooding potential. So it's put out in one, three and six hour uh, time chunks. Is really, if you go anything beyond six hours, it's not really flash flooding at that point. It'd be more uh, what we term to as uh, aerial or more uh, slower type flooding that's occurring, as opposed to the quicker response flashier type flooding that occurs. So across the uh, 
large amount of the Susquehanna uh, River Basin here, um, the uh, again the Mid Atlantic River Forecast Center Hydrologic Service area. You see what's their gridded flash flood guidance for uh, for one hour in this particular image. So a pretty wide swath uh, getting into the um, lar by and large inch one to two inches, inch and a half to two inches. So that's really the values we would be looking at on average to see flash flooding initiating. So if you're in a more impervious service or an urban area where there's a lot more concrete development, we may look closer to the lower range of that, so say an inch to inch and a half to see flash flooding. Whereas if we're in a flatter, um, more forestry type vegetation type area, it may be on the higher end of that where we'd uh, look more so to be issuing flash flood warnings uh, for a particular event. So uh, as Rachel mentioned, these, uh, these slides are available in PDF format. And this link's hyperlinked there if you're interested in looking at that. And, um, and, and by definition too, it's looking at more of the, the smaller streams uh, when uh, water would be overspilling the natural banks uh, in terms of this guidance. So uh, again, the, uh, you know, it's gonna vary just depending on where it occurs, uh, how fast it how fast it does occur, but this gives you an idea of the of the rates over again the one hour here, and then you can also get the three and six hour guidance. And then another type of uh, or guidance produced uh, by the river forecast centers across the country is, uh, is headwater guidance. So the, as opposed to the flash the flash flooding we were just talking about, this is more uh, rainfall over a particular what's called a basin. So defined um, geologically, not, not always by uh, you know, certain uh, geological or political boundaries, but just basically a, a particular uh, drainage or basin area where water would fall into. And then um, once you get that particular amount of rainfall, you could see uh, flooding occurring at the outlet um, of that particular basin here. So you see the example, uh, you know, three inches over Dover, Maine, that one hour period would produce flooding. Um, in Caribou's uh, hydrologic service area. And then the product here, you see the one, three, and six hour. And then uh, just due to this being a little slower uh, nature type flooding, we also have the half a day and then 24 hour guidance uh, that's available too. So again, this is kind of looking at the, the slower response type flooding. So maybe with a river or a, or a larger basin where you could see flooding at that, you know, the outlet or inlet of that particular basin. Um, over a period of time. And uh, one of the last ones I think I'm going to talk about here, the river, uh, the flood outlooks that are issued daily. So again, you see in this particular map, the entire uh, forecast area, service area, of the MARFC. Uh, in this particular instance, not looking at any you know, significant flooding to occur, but Say back in uh, around Christmas time, we had some flooding occurring, and uh, you saw a larger area of the yellow, uh, the, the possible um, the notion of flooding occurring, and then eventually we saw you know, smaller pockets of the likely taking hold as things became more into focus, and we started to actually realize and see some of the rainfall. So these are issued for uh, for five day, uh, the next five days. But uh, just to keep in mind, and this is all explained really well on their page, they use, I believe, 72 hours or three days worth of rain, the previous 72 hours of rainfall um, incorporating into that or, or going out in the future, if you will. So it's not it's not the, four, the full five days that go into the forecast, but it's, it's three days, 72 hours. And they can change that uh, just depending on the particular event at hand there. But if you see a lot of the reds, of course, occurring, Flooding is ongoing, and then the, the maps we looked at with the green dots there would certainly be more uh, would be warmer in color, more the oranges, uh, maybe maybe reds and purples too. So just gives you a kind of a brief uh, overview of some of the guidance tools you can use on, on what we'd be looking at internally for uh, for flash flooding and river flooding, and then uh, some of the outlooks here that give you an idea of where the heavier uh, heavier rainfall and higher impacts might be. So I'm going to turn it over to Connor here to talk about uh, outlooks on the national scale and then a little bit about um, alerting and some other various aspects. Thank you, Jonathan. 
Uh, yeah, so here we have a couple maps of uh, WPC's excessive rainfall outlooks. Uh, one is from 2020. This is from last August, uh, Hurricane uh, Isaias. I always pronounce the, uh, the hurricane wrong. Um, but yeah, this was towards the end of the summer and uh, actually provided to, to some areas so much needed rainfall. But you can see the color coding here. I'll get into a little bit more. Um, if you've ever looked at an SPC, Storm Prediction Center, uh, outlook about uh, severe, severe weather risk for a day, very similar color coding um, method here. We have marginal, slight, moderate, and high. And uh, when you're looking to the moderate and the high risk, uh, that's where you're looking at uh, not just isolated or sporadic, but uh, potentially all throughout an area as a, as a, um, at a very high risk for, for flooding. Um, and we saw that we had a lot of rain in um, not just a short period of time, but heavy rain for a, a prolonged period of time, uh, as typically occurs with, with tropical systems. Um, particularly if you're in Lancaster County and, and points east, um, the eastern part of the state uh, experienced a lot of rainfall from, from the storm. And uh, this one is here on my right. This is from 2018. This was, uh, a lot of you may remember, the, the second half of that summer and early fall, a lot of rainfall. Um, a lot of farmers, I think, had some issues too with uh, with crop failure and uh, issues with, with their fields being flooded just because of the massive amount of rainfall. Um, for folks who, uh, you know, are maybe new to the area, you might think, oh, Pennsylvania is all the way up here, a thousand miles north from uh, Gulf of Mexico and uh, Caribbean Sea and so forth, you know, they don't get affected by by tropical storms or anything. While typically we aren't we don't experience like the storm surges, uh, typically even winds from, from tropical systems were um, we're pretty safe from those. But the moisture, uh, we are uh, we are very much um, in the in the danger zone. Oftentimes, as anybody who's who's lived here for more than a few years can can attest. Um, from years and years, August, September, October, tropical storms and, and sometimes hurricanes can make their way up north and uh, dump several inches of, of rain in our county warning area. Um, and it's not just tropical storms and systems, it's oftentimes when you just have a feed of deep tropical moisture coming from points south, like the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, when you have that, that conveyor belt, if you will, uh, stretching up northward, that's where you can get a lot of precipitable water and precipitable water uh, basically just means if you know where I'm standing, the column of atmosphere above my head. If you were to wring all that atmosphere out like a um, like you would like a towel, how much rainfall would come out? So you know if you're, if there's three inches of precipitable water in uh, the atmosphere column around you, that means if you're to wring all that moisture out, you get three inches of water on the ground. Um, it's basically a, it's a really helpful metric for determining. Um, moisture content and um, should rainfall occur, how much you could expect. Uh, and when you have these deep tropical moisture feeds, you're looking at a lot of precipitable water and a lot of potential for, for heavy rainfall. And so this summer, uh, we got a lot of it. We had that deep tropical moisture feed um, and it led to a lot of uh, high heavy rainfall events. This was actually, um, if, you, if you went to the uh, NWS 101 talk last month, um, you heard me share this story this uh, July 2018 was when I got married, and uh, we kept our, uh, our all our wedding presents in the basement of uh, my in-laws' house in Lancaster County. We woke up 2:30 in the morning. Um, all of us woke up to six inches of water in the basement, and all the wedding gifts floating there. Um, everything wound up being okay. They were sealed. Um, we got the sump pump running, and everything it took several hours to. Um, to uh, get get all the water out of the basement, but uh, it just goes to show you, and that th their house is not in an area that's that's very flood prone. So when you get into these moderate to high risk events, it doesn't matter if you are you know near a creek bank or not. Um, everybody you know needs to really take precautions, take adequate uh, preparation measures, because uh, it can happen anywhere, uh, particularly in your low lying areas in your basement and the low lying areas of your property um, are at risk. So I'm going to move forward here. So this is just to spell a little bit more in more detail about those four categories. Again, um, whenever you see an excessive rainfall outlook, uh, whether it's marginal or, or above, you do want to be weather aware. Um, typically when it's marginal or slight, uh, the, the greater risk is in those typically more flood prone areas. Um, you might know the, those particular areas in your town or village, um, maybe those roads that, that tend to always flood after a heavy thunderstorm. Um, 
you know, maybe the, the roads that are kind of near a low-lying you know, tributary or, or creek. Um, those are the areas that are going to be more, more flood prone. Of course, you always want to, to take adequate precautions. But when you start looking into the moderate and the high risk, um, that's where it doesn't really matter whether or not you're in a super low-lying area. Um, pretty much everywhere, you need to, you need to um, act as if you're in danger. Of, of flooding, uh, regardless of, of where your house is located, where your travel route is, um, you want to take that into consideration and potentially, um, in some of these more severe cases, maybe just forego all traveling altogether. Um, that's when you're looking at a higher risk to, to life and to property. Uh, again, uh, not as, as common as, as marginal and slight, but uh, can occur particularly during um, the summer and maybe early fall too in Pennsylvania when we do have, um, whether it's heavy rainfall events from, from thunderstorms or um, more often um, than you might think, uh, tropical systems too that you know come up from the Gulf of Mexico and, and the Atlantic um, and bring with them lots of water. Here we go. Uh, I want to mention quickly the uh, precipitation climatology of Pennsylvania, just to get an idea of um, typically what to expect around the uh, during the year uh, in, in different seasons. So uh, here in Pennsylvania, precipitation is decently uniform through the year, but um, a good amount of it occurs during the warm season versus the cold season. Uh, the reason being that due to all the, the thunderstorms that we get in the warm season, the con, uh, we call it convective activity. So, you know, those pop-up thunderstorms, maybe the cold front thunderstorms uh, that you get also tropical uh, systems in the late summer, early fall also contribute to this. Um, so we do tend to be a little bit drier in the winter time, but extreme precipitation can occur year round. Um, so that is something to, to take into consideration. Uh, here's just a little graph here. This is based on um, Harrisburg. And uh, the, the lines here, that's for temperature. So we don't have to worry about that. I'm looking more at these green uh, bar, bars right here. That corresponds to the, um, to the axis here. This is precipitation in inches. So you can see, you can kind of see in the, in the warm season. So we're looking May through September. That's where you get a little bit more rainfall throughout the year. Our peak month, at least in, in Harrisburg, is July. Um, again, a big part of that is that's when um, severe weather and those pop-up thunderstorms, which can dump a lot of water in a short period of time. It's oftentimes um, when we get a peak in, in that activity. You also see September here. Um, you get a good amount of rainfall. September can be kind of a, a, a feast or famine month where if you don't have a lot of tropical activity, um, it's pretty dry. It's a, a nice time of year, pretty sunny and not too warm um, and not a lot of um, rainfall activity. But if you do have an active tropical uh, tropical year, we have a few systems coming up our way and each one is dropping one to two inches of rainfall, then you could get um, a very above average uh, rain, rainfall for, for late summer and early fall. Uh, and by season, uh, where we're at right now in March, you know, we're late winter, early spring. Typically, um, we're looking more at the, uh, the the river flooding can be a higher risk this time of year compared to other times of year um, due to snow melt. For the most part, snow melt is um, done in in central Pennsylvania. There may still be some areas with uh, with snow cover, but the the um, bulk amount uh, of the snow melt uh, finished up over the past couple of few weeks. Uh, ice jams also, again, we're looking more a little bit earlier compared to now, uh, but this is around the time of year, February, March, when um, when river flooding tends to be a, more of a concern. Miranda spelled out the few different time, types of flooding you can get, uh, flash flooding, aerial flooding, and river flooding. Um, the nice thing, if there's any nice thing about river flooding, is that you can get, like she said, uh, more of a, a lead time. So particularly if you're in Harrisburg, you know, there's a lot of snow melt occurring, um, say up in northern Pennsylvania, up in the um, Allegheny Plateau there, you might be able to know, okay, in a couple days, that's when the river levels are going to slowly rise. So you have some time to time to prepare there. Uh, as we're getting into now into to spring, into summer, now we're starting to turn, you know, switch gears into severe weather season. Um, and again, where we're looking at convective rainfall, that's where you can get kind of those hit or miss thunderstorms where maybe you might not get one during a day if, if um, you know the forecast says scattered thunderstorms but if you do get one you know that you can pick up a good amount of rainfall in maybe a half hour or even less time that's where we're looking at flash flood and that's where you really don't have a lot of lead time so particularly when you have flood watches out um, or you know that uh, today's going to be a, a thunderstorm day um, you really want to be weather aware in the sense that um, there's not going to be a lot of time between when that thunderstorm hits and when any subsequent flooding flash flooding occurs uh, so really really that's when we really want to be thinking about turnaround don't drown 
Um, and that's really a risk from about now, more, more so into April, and then continuing through through July and August. That's our more peak uh, convective season. And I mentioned late summer, early fall uh, is when the tropical rainfall events occur. That's more so an aerial flooding event as for it's kind of uh, uniform, heavy rainfall throughout the area, a more longer duration, sometimes maybe like a 12 hour or even more event that tends to cover the whole area. Um, the, fit, the, the positive, if you will, with, with aerial flooding is that you can predict, okay, if this tropical system is coming through, we can say um, with, a, with a decent amount of lead time, okay, this whole area is gonna be affected um, compared to maybe like the, the pop-up thunderstorm days where it's okay, everybody needs to be prepared, but um, you know, Harrisburg might get a thunderstorm York and Lancaster might not get a thunderstorm, that, that type of thing. In an aerial type of event, uh, we might, we're, we'll be um, in a position to more confidently say, okay, everybody's gonna get a good amount of rainfall, some maybe more than others, but everybody's going to, to experience this, so everybody's able to, to be more prepared. Um, so that's just a little bit of what to expect. Again, um, you know, flash flooding, can occur throughout the year, river flooding can occur throughout the year, and same thing with aerial, um, but that's just by season what the, the higher risk categories are and, and how to prepare accordingly. So some of you maybe may have seen this map before, or a map similar to this before, it's the FEMA flood risk map, and that's available to you online. I included a, a couple links here. Um, this is a screenshot for Marietta, Pennsylvania, in Northern Lancaster County, uh, right along the Susquehanna. Um, very, very pretty area, but it is a flood prone area being pretty low level uh, once you get downtown towards the river. Um, and these maps are really helpful for, um, for just to have an understanding of where you are, where you live. Also, if you're traveling, always a, a good thing to know, you know, if it's a, if you're dealing with river flooding or something and you want to plan your route accordingly, you know, okay, I, I want to try to avoid um, more, more flood prone areas. This is a, a great tool to, to check out um, I'll spare you all the details of what these um, markers mean. A, a key can be found at this link, uh, but in a nutshell, you have the blue, which is the, the highest risk area, and then the orange, which is slightly lower risk. Um, this kind of corresponds to, if you ever heard like the term like a hundred year flood, uh, which essentially means like a one in a hundred year kind of flood. Um, and so the, the blue essentially corresponds to a 1% chance that you'll see a um, it's, it's the 100 year flood area or that um, one in every 100 years you'll get uh, a flood of a certain magnitude um, or there's a 1% chance every year, one out of every 100. Um, you can read a little bit more detail about, about that online, uh, but it's also helpful. Um, I, I've read that the, the past year or so with the coronavirus, um, a lot of folks have been relocating and these are really really helpful tools to check out to see you know what's the flood risk of the place i may potentially relocating to um maybe i want to invest in flood insurance uh, those types of things just really helpful to to know just for situational awareness also want to discuss uh wireless emergency alerts and some of the changes that have been made uh in a nutshell trying to make these more optimized um more efficient more effective um we're, we're looking to try and make them as, as impact based as possible this is an example uh, of a WEA from a couple years ago, I believe, um, for Ellicott City, Maryland. Uh, some of you may have read in the news uh, the, the really bad flooding that occurred in Ellicott City a couple of years ago, where uh, you know streets were were literally turning into to rivers and streams. It was a very bad situation. Uh, but the whole idea, trying to make these uh, WEAs just a lot more optimal to give you just uh, the condensed, important information that you need. Um, Want to make sure that if you're in a position where you're you're in a risk in a high risk area you're going to get the the information that you need so uh, in this case if you're considered in a considerable or catastrophic flash flood zone um so this way you're not getting a buzz anytime you know there's a quarter inch of rainfall but if you are in in a in in a risk and high risk area you're going to get that information as soon as possible and this just spells out the information of the time the area um the source and impact some of the places that are at risk and just some important life or death, just important information of seek higher ground, uh, those sort, that sort of information. So trying to make it just as to the point as possible. And also highly recommend um, to ensure that, you know, if you have a mobile device, make sure that, that um, you have the ability to get these wireless emergency alerts, especially if you're traveling. Uh, super, super helpful just to, just to know um, if there's any danger where, 
leaving the, the um, snowfall season, but these can be really helpful for traveling if you're dealing with snow squalls. Um, now dealing into convective season, helpful to know if you're heading into a, a thunderstorm and particularly a thunderstorm that's dropping a lot of a lot of rainfall in a short amount of time, really, really helpful just for, again, situational awareness and um, taking the adequate precautions. Inundation maps are also available online at this link. Um, they're helpful uh, just in general. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a map geek, so uh, I love just being able to explore with, with, with these sorts of spatial tools. Um, but they're really, really helpful in visualizing, you know, what does a, a minor flood look like in my area? What does a major flood look like in my area? Um, we'll show you, you know, what parts of, of your area would be considered inundated or, or covered by floodwaters in a minor versus moderate versus, versus major flood stage. Uh, and can also show you the forecast, the river forecast um, upcoming. Hopefully, it's pretty boring. Hopefully, you see something like this. Uh, I took the screenshot a few days ago. Uh, this is around Harrisburg and in uh, eastern Cumberland County and uh, shows a, a pretty boring forecast in the sense that no flood stage is expected but it does help you visualize just so you can understand okay what parts of my city would be affected in this sort of a flood just gives you a better grasp of what those what those stages mean um, so i encourage you to check out this link too just to have a, um, a better understanding of that and then ensemble forecasts um, we're just leaving the winter snowfall season where you've probably heard all sorts of things about models and you know this model saying four to eight inches of snow well this model saying eight to 12 inches of snow um and so oftentimes models will be broken down into ensembles so if you have one particular model they may have 20 different ensemble runs meaning uh, 20 different scenarios that that one rock model might run to give you an idea of the uncertainty in a forecast so the range of possibilities of uh, you know in the case of uh, snowfall you know super high snowfall versus super low snowfall and then also the most expected uh, the expected range so say you have 20 models 15 of them are in this one zone of like three to five inches of snow then we can feel pretty certain at least that that model is indicating um, that that's the most likely range it also works for um for predicting flood levels or uh, uh, river stages um, where it can give you you know this is the gess the gfs ensemble uh, that's what the E stands for uh, in GFS. Uh, can give you, a, you know, this one particular model run. This is the like the worst case, the highest stage scenario. And this blue line down here is the lowest case scenario. So according to this model, there are 20 some odd parts. Um, the likely stage, well, for here, you know, five days out is going to be in between these two lines. Now, most likely, this teal line up here was an outlier. Um, and we can tell that because this orange shaded area shows you the most most likely spot. So most of the model members indicated somewhere around here, um, meaning that this was probably just an outlier um, that the, can feel pretty confident that it's going to be closer to the to the lower range. Uh, these are really helpful. One of the many tools that hydrologists and meteorologists use in um, giving their forecasts, just so we can understand um, what's what's the uncertainty of the forecast, what are the range of possible scenarios. Um, and while these are useful tools, they're used in addition to forecaster experience, um, not only the, the education and the technical training that folks have been have, have received over the years, but also a lot of the forecasters here have been in central Pennsylvania for years or sometimes decades um, and know the nuances of the different tributaries and the, the creeks and the rivers and so forth. Uh, and can be able to use that working knowledge um, to really generate a helpful forecast. Um, that's what's really, really helpful about having um, meteorologists and hydrologists working 24-7. You know, um, models can be great and really, really can give you a good frame of reference for what to expect, but it's super helpful to have experts um, behind the scenes to interpret those data um, and also work in their knowledge and experience to give uh, the most optimal forecast possible. You can check these out too if you're interested. Here's a link at the bottom. Um, we're trying to give you as, as many links as possible if you're if you're interested um, and just to explore some of the resources available through the Weather Service. Here's a, a term we like to use sometimes is it's one-stop shop. So um, on the, the topic of being optimal so that you can, uh, you know, one click and get all the information you need. So this link right here gives you the briefing, uh, just basically in a nutshell, what's the weather gonna be like today? What's it gonna look like around the area? And in addition to you know high and lows and thunderstorm risks and so forth, you can also get potential rain, rainfall and flooding. This is helpful for uh, particularly if, if you're traveling. Let's say you know you're looking down here. Let's say okay, we live in in Harrisburg in the the capital area. Um, you know okay, my, my flood risk, my precipitation risk is pretty low. 
but I'm planning on heading up to New York State later today. And well, it looks like I'm gonna be driving through a, um, an area that might be getting some more rainfall or slightly higher flooding risk. It's just helpful for, for you to plan your day accordingly. And again, that's available to you at the link in the top right. Uh, last but certainly not least is Skywarn training. Um, some of you here may be spotters or, or may be uh, familiar with the weather spotting program. And if so, thank you very much. Um, your, uh, your work is super, super important for uh, what we all do at the, at the weather service. Um, if you're unfamiliar or, or curious about this program, uh, in a nutshell, it gives you uh, training to be, a, to be a weather spotter. So it gives you some of the technical training to anything from um, you know, spotting a funnel cloud during severe weather events to taking snowfall reports uh, in your backyard when, when a snowfall event occurs and how to send the data uh, up to the weather service. Uh, super, super important because it helps us uh, with, with forecasts and also uh, disseminating important information to the public. Um, normally these talks will be in person, but due to, due to COVID, uh, they've been virtual. We just had one yesterday. There's another one coming up this Saturday, next Tuesday, um, and then a week from tomorrow, I believe. Hard to believe, April 1st. Um, but yeah, more information if you want to register, if you're interested, uh, you can click that link. Um, we're also happy to ask any questions about this program. Um, but yeah, thank you very much to all spotters who are in attendance here today. With that, I'll bring it back to either, I don't know if it's going to be Charles or Rachel, but. <laughs> All right, thank you, Connor. Thank you, everyone who presented. I don't know if uh, everyone wants to turn back on their webcams and we can all conclude here. Um, apologies again that mine isn't working, but I did see some questions. Hopefully your questions did get answered. If you have any additional questions, feel free to pop those in the chat right now or uh, connect with us. You can uh, call us with our new telephone number. You can reach out on social media or even um, you'll be getting an email after this certifying that you attended and with more additional resources so you can uh, ask us a question that way too if you're um, still curious about some things so i haven't seen any new questions come through yet if there are no questions thank you so much for attending ah someone asked okay do, do they have a lot of animals um, are there resources for me to prepare? Yes, there are. Um, FEMA has put out a lot of uh, resources ever since Hurricane Katrina um, of how to handle pets in severe weather situations or emergency situations, especially if you have to evacuate. What do you do with your animals? So um, let me pull up a link here and I'll pop it in the chat. All right, that's a great question. Um, so if you go to ready.gov slash pets, um, that's pretty much uh, like a guideline of what you can do to help prepare your pets for disasters, evacuations, severe weather, um, how to build an emergency kit, and then uh, also like where you would have shelters nearby that would um, allow pets if you have to evacuate to a shelter. So Ready.gov also has a lot of different different resources for a lot of different weather events like fire weather, lightning, uh, flooding, of course, and a bunch of other things. So go on there too and figure out what your resources are and where your evacuation centers are um, that FEMA has provided to you. Yeah, I just uh, did a quick Google for Flood for flood preparedness with animals, and there's there's some there's a lot of different links. What Rachel just said is good. Ready.pa has stuff. Even PetSmart has a page. So uh, there's a there's a there's a, there's, a, there's stuff out there. And with all you, all the pets that you that you have, Sharon, um, it's definitely a good idea to to be prepared and to know what to do. Because uh, trying to round ten dogs and cats up uh, with a few minutes' notice is probably not going to be uh, easy. Yep, yeah, exactly what Chuck said. All right, are there any other questions? If not, thank you so much for attending for this hour. We hope you all have a wonderful lunch. Um, 
and hope to see you at the next Weather Ready Nation lecture. We'll be hosting another one here in April for Severe Weather Awareness Week. So we'll be talking about severe weather safety. So we hope to see you for that one too. Thanks for attending. And if you have questions, just let any of us know.